or received in Wise County. He came down and did a, um, did a presentation on sports turf for a group of people a few years ago, and it was a really good program, and I appreciate Dr. Goatley speaking this evening. We, uh, myself, Chad, and Jeremy, we do get a lot of phone calls on uh, residential turf and uh, weed control and establishment and so forth. And uh, so I asked Dr. Goley to just talk about spring lawn management because I thought that would be of, of interest to a lot of folks. So, uh, so Dr. Goley, thank you for joining us tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. It is my pleasure. I was telling Shad and Jeremy, for those of you on the other side of the border, uh, that I haven't lived there in 40 years, but if you ask me where I'm from, I'm from Springfield, Kentucky, and I went to UK, and I said, we're not going to talk basketball this year. We can talk tech basketball because it's much better in Blacksburg than it is in Lexington. But uh, anything that I can do that would support you all, uh, let me know as well, because I work for the clientele of Virginia, but it's my pleasure to uh, talk to anyone if they'll listen to what I got to say. So I'm going to talk to you all about uh, things to be doing here in the near future as we get ready for spring, and it won't be as long as we think it is even with the weather that we've got going on, listening to you all talk about things. Uh, my sister's in Bardstown and she said, it sounds like uh, there's gunfire uh, going on there in relationship to what's happening with the, uh, the trees that are splitting. Uh, and I'm hoping we don't get that in Blacksburg. Last I heard was two to four inches of snow here and then maybe a little ice. All right, are y'all seeing the screen? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. so. Uh, you see the name. Uh, if I can help you, you also see if any of you all do the Twitter thing. Uh, extension uh, encouraged me a few years ago to have more of a social media present, uh, presence, even though I'm not much of a social media person. But that's how you can follow what we're doing uh, with Virginia Tech Turfgrass. And I work here with a group of uh, about six of us, which we've got a one of the largest uh, turfgrass faculty uh, programs in the country now, and uh, two of them are in Virginia Beach, which we won't talk much about what their grasses are over in that part of the world, uh, thinking about where you all are, but you're welcome to ask me anything that you think of tonight. You jump in. Uh, I don't care if you voice over, if you chat, you do whatever, make sure we get your questions answered, and if I don't have an answer for you, then I've got resources here uh, and still have my contacts back in Lexington that I talk to on a regular basis there. So let's make sure we get everybody's questions answered. The first thing that I tell people, and this is something that we had in place in Virginia long before I got here, but it's been something that I probably get the most pleasure out of uh, working on every year and getting it updated, is you got to choose the right grasses. And uh, where we live, now I'm preparing this talk uh, for our location for tonight that we're mostly going to be talking cool season, but you all can grow some warm season grasses where you are. And many of the football fields, especially over in Fields area there, when I go into southwest, far southwest Virginia, many of those fields have been Bermuda grass for years and years and years, and it's an outstanding choice. But Take a look at this information that we put out every year uh, for Virginia and uh, University of Maryland. We tag team because I do research plots in Blacksburg in the mountains. Dr. Durr, my colleague at Virginia Beach, maintains research plots uh, over at uh, the Hampton Roads area. And then the University of Maryland, Dr. Tom Turner does plots there. And based on this big geographical triangle, we develop our variety recommendation list, which details the field trials that are telling us what are the best grasses in terms of performance. And if they give us two years of uh, good performance in the field, they look good, they don't get a lot of disease, they don't show a lot of uh, moisture, uh, drought stress, they don't winter kill, things like that. So two years moves them into this category, promising. And so we've got Bluegrass, uh, tall fescue, fine fescue, perennial ryegrass, Bermuda grass, and zoysia grass all on this list. So two years gets it to promising. And if they can go to three years in terms of top performance, then they get uh, graduated up to recommended. And that's our highest ranking that we provide. And again, this is across that big geographical triangle. So it has to do good in Blacksburg, Maryland, and Virginia Beach to make it on our list. So it's going through some cold weather and some hot weather. 
uh, and all things in between when it comes to moisture. And this is no guarantee. There's never going to be a guarantee of where we live in terms of a best grass, but this is the best information that we can provide you in terms of based on field data, what the heck we think is going to give you the best opportunity for success. And uh, I would suspect that most of you on tonight's call that we're talking about tall fescue, uh, maybe fescue Kentucky bluegrass. If you're really into your lawn, uh, Kentucky bluegrass is the prettiest grass on the planet, but it requires a lot of bells and whistles to manage. And maybe if you're a low input turf, you might have a little fine leaf fescue. And those are the grasses which perform best. One of your challenges is going to be to find these particular cultivars, these varieties. Uh, and you'll have to do some asking around because you can bet that most big box retailers uh, aren't going to carry our grasses because this is what Virginia Tech and University of Maryland say you should be planting. They're going to buy on the basis of, uh, you know, what can they get at a good price? And they might have some great grasses, but if I don't see them in my field trials, uh, that I don't have any basis to give a recommendation for them. Uh, and that, that's why you won't see them. So again, I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying I don't know when it comes to that. So be aware that this is there. It gets updated basically mid-year of every year. It doesn't change a lot from year to year, but over four or five years time, it basically does almost completely turn over because new grasses keep coming on the market. And the other thing, and I bet you've heard this from any extension person to give you any presentation, including my colleagues here in the offices, is uh, you can't overemphasize the importance of a soil test. Uh, this to me is, I've got that little box there. Think of this as a physical for you at the doctor in relationship to doing the right thing. And if you don't have a soil that is properly prepared to grow grass, then you're not going to grow grass very successfully. And I suspect you all aren't blessed with deep soils over in that part of the world. I don't have deep soils here in Blacksburg and we kind of do the best we can, especially after uh, building houses and things on these sites where most of what little topsoil we had is long gone. But we need to do this at least every three to four years. You don't need any specialized equipment. I do ask people try to put this in a clean, plastic bucket, if you can, as you see there, to avoid any contamination from any type of metal, uh, because you're going to get numbers back from the lab in Virginia. We still have an active soil testing lab uh, that runs these samples. There's a whole host of uh, private labs that do this as well, but you only need to do it once every three to four years. And in Virginia, our price is $10 a sample. It's the best information that you can get because it allows you to make an informed decision, no more guessing. Uh, you're gonna apply only the lime, the phosphorus, the potassium, et cetera, that the soil test report says that you need. And I'll keep reemphasizing over and over in this presentation. One thing we're trying to do no matter where you live is kind of move away from the mindset that you treat lawns like you would treat a garden. A, uh, a grass plant does not have the same nutritional requirements. So it's a, a pretty simple plant, not the most uh, exciting plant to talk about, uh, but a plant that ends up doing some pretty amazing things for us out in the environment. And how deep do you need to go? Try to get down to four inches if you can, three inches minimum. Uh, that would give you a good representation of what that root system is going to be exposed to because 80 to 85% of your turf grass root system is gonna be found in that top four inches. Uh, so you don't need a you know, $125 stainless steel probe, nice if you got one, but anything you can do to get down three to four inches, take 10 to 15 samples per area, kind of randomly staggering across your lawn, mix those in the bucket, that's gonna give you roughly about a half pint of material. And uh, basically what we do with that half pint of material is that could equate all the way up to something in the area of an acre and provide us pretty meaningful data. And if you have any problem spots, then there's an opportunity for you to do a little detective work. Uh, see if the limiting factor is something that's related to the soil um, and spend a little bit extra money there. And I tell people, think about this for 20, maybe $30 at the most, if you got a big yard, you're covered for three to four years. You know exactly what your soil needs. And again, it's the first step 
towards growing the best lawn, the best plant materials that you possibly can. And you know the value of this for growing any other crop. It's the same thing when it comes to your turf grass system as well. So it is your first step in doing things the right way when it comes to your lawn. And these are my seasonal growth patterns for cool season turf grasses. So again, my emphasis tonight is thinking about things that like our colder climates in this country. So tall fescues, Kentucky bluegrass, fine leaf fescues, perennial ryegrass. If you're a golfer, you probably pay, play on uh, bent grass putting greens. This is what their growth response does here in the uh, eastern part of the United States is Right now, believe it or not, we are in a range of where we're just starting to see, even as crappy and cold as the weather is, that we're going to be soon seeing an increase in root development for these cool season grasses. And this goes on about the only people that even realize this is happening are golf course superintendents that are out cutting cups on a regular basis. And uh, they're checking out what's happening uh, with the root system below ground, obviously. And when we get into early spring, we actually have a peak period of root development, the highest it is for the entire year for cool season grasses. Of course, we're not paying attention to that. What gets people excited about their lawns and think about what will be happening soon because most people put their mowers array away in the fall and they're cursing their lawn. They can care less about mowing grass anymore. I hate mowing grass. I'm tired of mowing grass. Don't want to cut grass again. But there's something about when grass starts being mowed in the spring, there's a smell. Uh, and you know what I'm talking about, relationship to grass, or even if you're cutting weeds. Around my neighborhood, the smell is mostly wild onion and wild garlic. But to me, that signals spring must be here. And people get interested in getting back outdoors and maintaining their turf. And that's when we see the greening happen. But notice what's going on here is later on in the spring, when shoots start going bonkers and you get excited about your lawn, your root system is going to start heading down because these two are inversely related in terms of what's going to happen. So this gets us pumped and this gets us excited about uh, maybe fertilizing, aerating, et cetera. But here's my take home message. It's hard to see this but this is secondary window. You need to do a little something in your lawn. Most people want to do something. They feel better for doing something in their lawn, but spring is not the time to uh, do the most aggressive management for your cool season grasses. That was back in the fall or will be again in fall of 2021. Uh, the reason plants live, this is a question I uh, ask my turf students when I go in and do guest lectures here at Tech and I taught for 15, 16 years at Mississippi State. Uh, and did all teaching advising there. And I'm like, first question was, why do grass plants not die every night when the sun goes down? And they're like, well, that's a stupid question. I was like, it is, but why? And we go into a discussion about plants survive day in and day out when the light shuts off and they're no longer making food on the basis of how much food they were able to store. This is carbohydrate. These things are right now, they went into the winter about as high as they're going to be and they're gonna consistently decline all the way until about next September. Uh, and so we can't stress these plants out and drain the tank. That's the food that's in the gas tank for these things. And it's gonna be a slow but steady decline. And what we've got to do is manage tops, roots and stored food all appropriately to keep these plants alive. We go into survival mode when it gets really hot in the summer. These grasses like temperatures that are 60 to 75 degrees. Okay, and so we've got an opportunity here in the mountains to grow a lot of those grasses quite well, but even we get temperatures, you know, well into the 80s, maybe lower 90s, and those plants are gonna struggle. They go through their struggle period, you keep them alive, okay? When you finally rebound, get back into late summer, fall, there's your primary window. So fall is the optimal time to establish, the optimal time to fertilize, the optimal time to aerate, and so many homeowners don't do it in the fall because again, they're tired of their lawn in the fall. But that is the window when you see both shoots, roots, and carbohydrates all on the increase. And that's why fall is a preferred time. So right now for another four to six weeks, we're just kind of in a holding pattern, but we're thinking about it. We're getting ready. We're gonna make adjustments as needed. So I'm gonna pause just for a second there 
to see because if y'all say, you know what, that almost makes sense. Uh, this is the most important piece of information that I can share with you tonight about growing any cool season grass because bottom line is if you get a rough idea of what's going on here, you can now make <coughs> informed decisions. So any questions or comments, or if you've got a dirty look for me that you want to share, that'd be okay too. I don't care, but tell me anything right now about this that does or does not make sense. Anything? Excellent. So you're either asleep or you understand what I'm talking about. So either way, you're coming out ahead. So let's talk a little bit about fertility. Um, the biggest mistake made year in and year out, both from the standpoint of the health of cool season grasses and for the environment in terms of where this stuff goes, is how much fertilizer, and I'm talking nitrogen now, how much fertilizer is applied during the spring. And again, here's the period when everybody's excited about doing that. So I've listed here that ideally you would apply only up to one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet total during the spring season. And that's totally flipped by a lot of people because think about what's gonna be happening shortly. And matter of fact, we saw a little bit of this during the Super Bowl about, we're gonna start seeing more and more advertising for Scott's for True Green, Chem Lawn, for everybody else that's doing lawn care. And uh, that's a business and they wanna sell product and services. And we even tell those professionals that in our climate, some is good, too much is bad. And the reason is if you aggressively fertilize in the spring, this line will be growing off the chart and you're gonna have a beautiful looking lawn that is going to crash and burn as summer stress arrives because remember the inverse relationship, as shoot growth is going up in the spring, it's happening at the expense of root growth. So what we wanna see you do is, hey, depending on your species that you're growing, emphasize the fall. You might put out up to two and a half pounds total for the entire fall season, September, October, November, okay? It all depends on your grass and what your goal is in a lawn because uh, everybody's got a different perspective on what makes a lawn that suits my needs. But think about that. If you're not doing that, adjust your principles to plan for this coming fall. Do a little bit in the spring. A little bit's good. A little bit's going to help root growth. A little bit's going to give you that color, that response that you want, you know, when you're shooting for yard of the month. But again, fool's gold, folks. Don't go crazy in the spring. Save your aggressive fertilization more so for the fall months than the spring. And think about this, I'll show you pictures later on. This makes sense in relationship to when we should establish. Uh, many of us have to try to plant in the spring and we know what follows spring in these cool season grasses and that's summer temperatures and summer moisture stress. And a cool season grass when it's mature is gonna struggle in a summer, okay? So fall is the ideal time to plant. And then we also think about, well, if your lawn needs to be aerated, what would you do? Well, same deal. Ideal time to aerate would be in the fall when optimal recovery is potential in place then, but you could do it in the spring. Just keep in mind what follows the spring and that's always gonna be the stressful period or the most stressful period for cool season grasses. And that's gonna be your summer stress of temperatures uh, and either too much or too little moisture. So let's focus on spring fertility just a little bit more. You're gonna see no greater response and probably no greater time in which you're interested in seeing response than for the spring. But having that greenest of lawns in the spring is not necessarily equated with having the healthiest of the lawns. The reason for that, as I've said, I'm gonna reiterate because it is just gospel truth. If you promote too much shoot growth in the spring, you are doing so at the expense of root growth. And this even applies in some cases more so for warm season grasses like Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. So if there's anybody out there tonight that says, well, I'm growing one of those two, can we please talk a little there? By all means, we'll do it. But uh, I'm guessing that that's probably gonna be few and far between for the audience that I'm addressing tonight. So your key to making the right call on when to put your nitrogen down in the spring and this is how I try to teach my students, how I try to talk to master gardener volunteers, is keep this in mind. Grass is growing when it needs mowing. 
And until that point, why would you put out a lot of fertilizer, especially nitrogen, when there are so many things that could happen to that nitrogen and most of those not being good? Either it's leached, it's transformed into plant unavailable forms. Again, it gets to be expensive and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but fertilizer prices are already going crazy and they're only going to keep going crazier based on what my colleagues in the fertilizer industry are telling me, especially my buddies in the uh, row crop folks. So turf, we don't have to spend a lot of money on a 10,000, 5,000 square foot lawn, uh, but we're gonna pay more. And we already are seeing that um, in relationship to fer fertility costs across the board, N, P and K, you name it, prices are going up. That last comment there is if you should happen to have warm season grass, you should try as best you can to wait until complete greening of that turf is completed and you are past any potential frost or freeze dates. So again, don't get caught in this trap of wanting to make grass too green too quickly. If you did your fall fertilization, there's where your response is gonna come from. And uh, I live in a neighborhood of which I think most people here in Blacksburg now kind of understand what I do. And I have a reputation as the lawn Nazi and that's the guy that does all the grass stuff and he's killing the environment, blah, blah, blah. I got a pretty good lawn, but I don't do a tremendous amount to it. But the one thing that I do quite a bit of is I emphasize my fall fertilization and my neighbors around me that don't do anything, again, it's gonna be, a, again, a very distinct difference. And I don't care about that they do or don't. My main thing is as long as they've got a decent enough turf that's stabilizing soil, then that grass is serving its purpose and it's doing its environmental job. And here is a sample fertility program that I took out of one of our extension pubs here, University of Kentucky. My buddy uh, is no longer there, Dr. Munshaw. Uh, Greg actually took my old position down at Mississippi State when I left uh, Starkville to come back to tech in 2004. Uh, he had my old phone number, my old office, et cetera, and he was at University of Kentucky for probably a decade, and he's got some awesome resources there at UK. This is from my program, and this is a sample fertility program for soluble nitrogen sources. Say you might just uh, get plain old agricultural grade urea uh, from any lawn and garden center, southern states, Walmart, doesn't make any difference and you'd say, I'm gonna put me out a fertility program to what you could do. This is an idea of what one might look like. This is absolutely not telling you, you better do this, but look at what I've got. Here's the months of application, okay, in this column. Here's the levels of N per thousand per year if you're growing tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, or Kentucky bluegrass, and probably fescue and blue would be two of the bigger ones for most of the audience tonight. Fine fescue, if you've got a good low input turf on the side of a hill somewhere, we grow a lot of that here in the mountains in Blacksburg. These are all warm season, we won't focus there. This gives you an idea of what we tell people are responsible rates in terms of plant response and environmental response. And we did some work, well, it's been five or six years ago now showing that our old rule of thumb about put out a pound of then per thousand, that's not bad, uh, but we showed that we could tighten that up and we could go out with uh, 0.7 pounds and still meet the needs and reduce the risk of losing uh, some of that nitrogen that's out there. And depending on your grass, a typical seasonal fertility program, emphasizing mostly the fall, is probably gonna put you in the two to three and a half pound per thousand square feet range. And if you don't need that much, that's great. I hope you don't need more. That's what we're trying to get people to understand. More is not always a good thing. If you're growing, Fine leaf fescue, say you've got a shaded lawn or really some thin rocky soil. Here's an excellent choice for you with limited mowing input. Maybe it's one to one and a half pounds. Don't worry that these numbers don't add up down here. They weren't intended to. It's just, this is what it could look like, but it certainly is not telling you, boy, you're making a mistake if you're not doing this. And guys, Shad, Jeremy, Phil, if y'all seeing questions out there, anybody's typing anything in, tell me to be quiet. Let's talk as we go through. I hate to do too much oh. clicking. I've only been doing this a year, and every time I click, it seems like I click something wrong. So I'm scared uh, to death after a year. Dr. Goldley, there was a question sure. that came up. I, I don't know if you want to answer it now or later, but uh, somebody asked, what do you suggest for grubs? Grubs. Let's talk a little bit later, but let's make sure I don't forget. Okay. Okay. 
So there's our emphasis point. Use this as a guideline to build yourself a program. Start thinking about it, but don't worry about it. I don't do it exactly like you do. This is a hundred different ways you could do this right. More than that, you could do it wrong. Just stay within these ranges, you're gonna be fine. And I told you the educational point. Now, being a, a country boy from Kentucky, and if I had my wherewithal to where I wanna eat, instead of eating fancy, I can name you every cracker barrel between Blacksburg and Springfield, Kentucky at all the exits off of I-77 and I-64, cause those are my stopping points. And I know that's not the healthiest of food, but it's what I grew up on, it's what I like but I equate Cracker Barrel eating on a regular basis with triple 10. Uh, what an awesome fertilizer, but that's a garden fertilizer. And we want people these days to understand that you don't need to apply triple 10, triple 13, triple seven, whatever it is year after year after year, because most likely you've got phosphorus levels so high you could mine your soil and sell your soil for phosphorus fertilizer. So get a soil test done, see where you need to be, think about the environment, save a little bit of money, treat your lawn like a specialty crop, more so than a garden crop because turf grasses don't need nearly as much phosphorus, that middle number here, as most of our garden plants do. So keep that in mind because this is a good thing we can do both to save some money and to help save the environment. Now, mowing. Okay, you heard my comment about uh, grasses growing when grass needs mowing. So turf grass people preach with the one third rules, what we call it, which means never try to remove more than a third of the leaf blade at any single cutting event. So if you're maintaining grass at three inches, nice and tall, that's gonna give you a really dense root system. Then uh, you take it down to two inches and you keep mowing that grass with frequency to be sure that you're never removing more than that one inch of that uh, three inch uh, cutting height that you're at. So think about that. For the spring, you've got an opportunity in the cool season world to, to take these grasses down on the lower side and to begin to slowly raise their cutting heights up before summer stress arrives. And that's the key is you can mow them, if you, don't, if you like mowing grass, and I love mowing grass, but now I've only got a 4,000 square foot lawn now. I uh, used to have a half acre and had a riding mower, but I can't even get a riding mower to back up and go forward in my lawn, so I got rid of it. Uh, but I like to cut grass. I like to watch it stripe. Uh, I feel a sense of accomplishment, so I'm weird like that. But I'll mow it on the lower side, and I've got tall fescue. I'll come out of the gate at two inches this spring, and I'll keep it there. And when I get uh, somewhere about mid-May, I'll raise my cutting height up as tall as my mower will go, slightly above three inches. And that's where I'll keep my grass through the summer months. And what I'm doing there is taking that pressure off that root system before summer stress arrives. If you wait until 4th of July to raise your cutting height, too late. Uh, really, it's probably doing the grass a uh, disservice now uh, to, to start growing it tall because you've got more foliage, you're using more water and you don't have the roots to support it. So about mid-May, raise your height up to a level that still meets what you would describe as, this is an aesthetically pleasing lawn. It looks good, but that'll help you maintain a sufficient root system and you'll have a much healthier plant as you get ready to go into the fall, okay? Warm season world, again, when it's hot, you mow it as often as you need to, and you mow it as low as a different species can tolerate. And there's our heights right there. This is a table for cutting heights for our most commonly used grasses when we grow them under optimal growing conditions. So there's our cool season world. Bluegrass, when it's prime time, inch and a half to two inches is where a standard lawn grass is going to be. So coming out of the gate here in the spring, Set those mowers at an inch and a half, keep the one third rule in place, okay? And keep cutting grass and then start raising it up in mid-May and end up the growing period of the spring at about two inches. Fescue, go two to three, you see the others there. It's never wrong to mow grass too tall. Uh, you can certainly get in trouble with repeated scalping and eventually thin your canopy out, increase weed pressure, uh, increased diseases, increased grubs, you name it. Uh, grasses are amazingly tolerant 
of cutting to begin with. Think about, you know, why is a turf grass a turf grass? It's because of where its growing points are located. But those growing points can be damaged. And when we talk about the stress that we place on these plants, if we uh, mistreat them during the summer with these cool season grasses, you can't keep mistreating them forever and expecting them to perform. And this is just an oldie but goodie slide shared with me by a colleague from Penn State. I bet this slide is, is older than me and I'm 59 years old, but uh, it's showing a common sense response of fine fescue. And this is a particular type called creeping red fescue that does really well in the shade uh, from unmowed which it tops out without seed heads at about four to five inches. And uh, my colleague, who's a turf weed specialist here at Virginia Tech is Dr. Sean Askew. And he lives up on top of Brush Mountain that surrounds uh, Blacksburg. And this is the grass that Sean grows on the side of the hill. And he goes out basically with the weed eater and kind of beats it down about twice a year. And that's his mowing requirement. So this is an awesome low input grass. It's a great cemetery grass. But look what happens to root system. You can maintain this grass. And I've been in the upper peninsula of Michigan and played golf on golf courses that were fine fescue tee to green. And uh, you can mow it that low as on a putting green for golf. But look what happens to the root system. Quarter inch over here, hardly any root system to speak of versus three quarters makes a huge difference, greater difference than an inch and a half. And this thing is pretty much indestructible if it's left unmowed. So again, common sense, but it's a very good demonstration of what happens to roots on the basis of how we clip grass. Okay, and now, all right, I'm gonna pause. Anything in terms of mowing that the group would like to ask? So Phil, Shad, and Jeremy, if y'all see anything there, shout at me. No, oh, you're good to go. Awesome. So let's talk about planting grass. Now I've already told you we do it, but ideally we wouldn't. Cool season turf grasses, fall is the preferred time for planting. And, and realistically for me it, and in the mountains, it's kind of more of uh, late summer. Cause I tell people when you start getting into the third week of August uh, at the elevations where we are and nighttime temperatures start pretty consistently dropping into the 60s, upper 50s, then you're good to go. But uh, that fall season is the ideal time for planting because we get all those growing months of September, October, November, maybe some of December, and then we get the spring to emphasize roots again and get that big search. And we set ourselves up for having the most mature plant we possibly could before summer stress arrives. So people that follow things in the industry uh, folks who are in professional lawn care, golf turf managers, et cetera, I tell them get themselves a soil thermometer and keep track of this just like you do air temperature. Go out there and put it in at an inch depth in the soil out in an area away from shade and let it equilibrate in the middle of the day. Go out there and see where the temperature is. And when you start consistent, consistently getting soil temperatures that are you know 60 degrees or less, that is the optimal soil temperature range for when these cool season grasses are going to perform best for you, okay? Number two, you gotta get soil to seed contact. So this is a completely tilled site and that's a no brainer when it comes to soil to seed contact because when that seed germinates and that root comes out and starts to explore that soil for moisture and nutrients, it will desiccate, dry up and fall off and that will soon be a dead seedling uh, if it doesn't have the ability to extract that moisture and nutrients from the soil. So we gotta get seed in contact with soil, even an, a plugger, an aerator that's pulling cores can do this job for us. Uh, this isn't as absolute as this, but that's a great way to kind of kill two birds with one stone is to aerate your lawn, make cores, seed over top of this, let the cores dry and then take a piece of chain link fence or if you're really up for it, a heavy duty rake, something, go out there and break those cores up, push some of that seed in the holes and create your soil to seed contact by uh, breaking those cores up and distributing the soil around your surface. If you uh, plant- Dr. Goldman. Go ahead, sir. 
Uh, I don't know if you wanted to address a red fescue question before you got much further. Let's do it, Phil. Uh, somebody asked, they said they're working with a cemetery in Hampton Roads and want to know his red fescue recommendation. And to add to that, they said the current tall fescue at the cemetery is being overtaken by Bermuda. Sounds like Galen, which I saw her ch uh, chime in there. And, right. Uh, that fine leaf fescue in full sun in Hampton Roads would be a, it'd probably be a problem. Uh, and Galen seen it out at uh, the Hampton Roads A-Rec where Dr. Durr and Adam Nichols have it in their shaded area. And it's wonderful there. So if it was a shaded situation, you'd have a fighting chance. The, the best um, low input, uh, limited maintenance turf in that area um, even better than tall fescue being overtaken by Bermuda, a.k.a. wiregrass, is zoysia grass based on our little, we did a simulated cemetery trial here. Uh, it's been over 10 years or so now uh, when I first come to uh, Blacksburg. And zoysia grass and uh, hard fescue, one of the fine fescues were the winners. Hard fescue in our cool climate, zoysia grass in a warm climate, but of course zoysia grass is expensive to establish. But I tell cemeteries, that get into a situation where they're uh, repairing small plots or preparing small plots at a time, it's not so crazy to start introducing zoysia grass into burial plots because that's a fairly small acreage to go with. So that would be my recommendation. I think it'd be a little too, uh, too hot, too sunny to be full sun and expect that the uh, fine fescues to make it over there. All right, Phil, any other? Uh, kind of grassing or planting questions and anything you say, whenever, we'll do it whenever. I have no preference. I think you're caught up. Okay. So we're talking about spring establishment. A lot of people have to do it, especially think about these last three years. This year is going to be another one in which we're already uh, off to a a start of uh, way above soil moisture, well, moisture in general, in terms of how much snow, rain, et cetera, we're getting. We've dealt with saturated soils now for uh, three seasons. Looks like four, number four season is on the way. I just put on Twitter a little thing from one of my extension colleagues over in the uh, Northern Neck of Virginia. It's getting questions about what do you do about saturated soils? Uh, so I put together a little blurb that you can find on uh, the at VA turf thing from I think yesterday or day before. And if you don't do the Twitter thing, just email me and I'll send it to you. But again, we got to wait for things to dry up and then we're going to need to aerate these soils to get them breathing again. And we are going to have to do some spring planting, uh, some spring aeration, et cetera. And uh, just keep in mind, it's not ideal. Your challenges are in front of you. The other thing is this third one here anticipate lots of weed pressure. All that disruption that you do, which is critical for establishing these cool season grasses, is also going to be nothing more than spreading crabgrass seed all over creation. You got to live with it. You got to deal with it. We've got some uh, chemical options, which are possibilities. Uh, there's an active ingredient out there called quinclorac, which can be used. Uh, Drive is a trade name, and another one called mesotrione. Tenacity is a trade name, which in cool season grasses give you a lot of flexibility. But just know that you are going to have some weeds, especially with spring establishments, much more so than you get with fall establishments. And so here are recommended seeding rates. If you give this a, uh, a shot this spring, and again, emphasizing those uh, top uh, five rows, uh, the two columns there, cool season world for most of you. Use the higher levels in terms of pounds of pure live seed per thousand square feet for spring because we know that we're going to probably lose more of this seed due to environmental stress. But don't go any higher than these high levels. It's a misconception by a lot of people. Well, if, if eight pounds of tall fescue is good, can you imagine how good 16 would be? And the answer would be it wouldn't be at all. It would all be dead due to the competition of putting all that seed out there. So keep these ranges in mind. Uh, pure live seed means check your purity and your germination percentages on that seed tag uh, because you're never gonna buy 100% pure live seed, but think if it was 80% pure and 80% germ, that's telling you it's 64% pure germinable seed, pure live seed. So uh, 
And if you bought 10 pounds of that product, you'd only have 6.4 pounds of actual pure living seed. That's what that PLS number means. So keep that in the back of your mind, but use these higher levels for going out here in the spring in terms of trying to get enough seed out there to give you a fighting chance to come through this first summer. And just a little bit more about cultivation. Um, a lot of lawns don't need to be cultivated. And you say, well, how do you know? Don't make it hard. Uh, take a screwdriver out to the lawn. And when a lawn is moist, now right now we're saturated. I think that's cheating. Uh, you'll be able to probe that. But go into a moist lawn later on this spring, because it's too early to do any of this right now anyway, uh, and take a screwdriver. And it doesn't matter if it's a flathead or a Phillips head and walk around. And if you can probe without having to go uh, Freddy Krueger and turn into a slasher and start stabbing the lawn, go out there and probe it. And if you can probe it three inches with a screwdriver without beating it or jumping up and down the screwdriver, you probably don't need to aerate. It's not that it's a bad thing, but it's probably not necessary. And the reason that uh, we need to aerate from time to time is usually on the basis of how much traffic does our lawn get. Again, the beauty of a turf grass plant is how much abuse that it can take. And again, think about it. Uh, when people are having a garden party, are they actually in a garden? And the answer is not usually. They might have the garden around them admiring the beauty of a garden, whether it's veggies or ornamentals, but they're usually walking on the grass. And uh, when you walk on this soil, you're compressing those particles together. And we're creating physical limitations from compaction because roots can't create space, they'll only find space. And we're also reducing the oxygen levels in these soils. And uh, the roots have got to have oxygen to respire, just like we are doing now as we're breathing, roots are respiring to burn that stored food and create energy. Uh, so they got to have oxygen. And think about everybody else that lives in the soil. Uh, lots of earthworms, lots of microbes, both beneficial bacteria and fungi. Uh, lots of beneficial insects that live there that do great things for us. They require oxygen as well. If you punch holes, you're going to improve uh, movement of materials into the soil to hold it there. So water, fertilizer, pesticides if needed. The common sense way to do cultivation is do it at a time when the plant is going to best recuperate. So we know that would be the fall, but you could do it in the spring, but do it in you know, early to mid spring, if at all possible. So, uh, and tie it together with seeding, with fertilizer or lime applications in which you can move the seed fertilizer lime into the soil and start the process of germination, soil modification, et cetera. Go ahead and kick it into gear and start the process. Now let's talk a little about pest management. This was a neighbor's lawn at uh, house number one here in Blacksburg. Uh, uh, the Goatley family uh, basically treats houses like a commodity. Uh, I have no repair skills whatsoever. If things start to break, we just move. And uh, my wife is a phenomenal uh, home decorator and I do a pretty good job in my yard, but this was my neighbor's yard. And they thought this was magnificent. And I still tell people my first bullet point there is, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If you're a turf grass person, you probably aren't too pleased having that beside you, but hey, it's their lawn. Uh, it's their choice. Uh, it bothered me because when all those dandelion flowers turned to puff balls, all that seed was moving on me. But again, that's their property. If they think that's beautiful, more power to them. What you have to decide is, well, how much pest pressure can you tolerate before you say, I wouldn't let mine get this far along, but I don't mind, ha mind having a dandelion plant or a patch of clover or a uh, plantain anywhere out here, doesn't bother me. So I tell people, think about a lawn weed management program as never being 100%. There's always something happening out there, uh, but maybe you live, uh, if you're really into your lawn, maybe you live in that 90 to 95% control and what I tell people that my goal is in my lawn is I like a good looking lawn. To me, uh, most turf grass professors have sorry looking lawns. I'm like, I don't want people to talk about me that way. Uh, I want them to say, well, yeah, he, he kind of got an advantage on us. He should know what he's doing. But I've got my, line, my lawn in shape where I basically do spot treatment of weeds as they emerge with a backpack sprayer. 
And it took a while to get there in all these houses that I've lived in, but that's my goal. And that is my weed control program. Uh, so you have to figure out what kind of lawn do you want? Uh, do you want to treat preventatively, say with a pre-emergent herbicide? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with applying pre-emergent herbicides according to the label. Those things have been tested by EPA. They've got the label for a reason. The label is the law, follow the label. Uh, you're not going to hurt the environment. The key is follow the label. Uh, and uh, many times, especially a situation like this, you got that under control and you think about what the seed bank would be, perhaps it would be environmentally responsible to use a preventative herbicide to keep this from happening. So when anybody says is one better than the other, uh, the best answer in growing turf grasses is typically it depends. And for my Kentucky friends, that was always an AJ Powell thing is uh, that was a common answer on exam there at UK. Here's something I want you to keep in mind. Somebody asked about grubs, and this is one of the issues that has come into play with uh, one of our standard grubicides, which is still an awesome material. But uh, the, the, the trade name of Merit, okay, and that's a very common product that we use to control grubs. Uh, that product is now, it's on the short list of, I hope we don't lose it, and especially hope we don't lose it for production ag because of how important it is and how effective it is with many of our ag crops. But in turf, it also has been a standard uh, grub product of, for us for many, many years. And this uh, active ingredient you'll find in just about everybody's product, whether it's Scott's or uh, any other company's material that's out there, is pay attention to what you see on these labels now, because we've had issues that came up uh, about five years ago now out in the Pacific Northwest where some folks came out and they applied an insecticide in this class to a tree that was in bloom and killed the hundreds of thousands of bees. Uh, so a catastrophe on all accounts for the bees uh, and for the lawn and landscape industry about you just did everything wrong that you could. Now we're trying to get people to understand that we need to protect these pollinators. And fortunately, it's not really that hard, but we've got some choices that we have to make that we can make in terms of uh, selection of pesticides. And if these products have any potential at all at affecting pollinators, you're gonna see that on the label now. So this pollinator protection box and this material is now very prominent on these types of products labels. Be aware of that, pay attention to what they say, like beware of drift, uh, watch when bees are foraging, don't make these applications. Then again, these are things that take people, uh, they gotta spend a little time here and pay attention to what's going on because we can do it right, we can certainly do it wrong. So I tell folks, this is a pretty common uh, lawn in my neighborhood. It certainly is not high input and there's nothing wrong here. But if I'm preaching to you about protecting pollinators, but you know that you've got a grub problem, okay, in this lawn that's going to require treatment because year in and year out, you just get blasted with grubs, okay? How would we treat with this product? This product's active ingredient is called imidacloprid, okay? And that is the, the active ingredient in the product Merit, which is, again, it's probably been our standard grubicide for years and, and it remains one of the most popular ones. But there are other products like this. You look at this and say, well, how the heck could you do that? Because can you imagine how many pollinating insects are foraging on these flowers? But there is a very common sense, takes a little bit of planning strategy that either you as the homeowner or a lawn care operator or a person hired to mow this lawn would have to do. So I'm gonna ask you all to see if you're awake, what would the answer be that would be a common sense turf grass management specific treatment for this to make it fair game to apply a pesticide that potentially could kill bees? What do you got for me? Any idea? I'm gonna venture up here and click this more box and see if that opens up the chat. 
There we go. All right, anyone got an answer for me? There we go. Leela's got it. Mow the flowers first. If you'll go out and cut the bloom off and then very promptly apply your material, you have removed the foraging material for the bees, okay? It can be that simple. Uh, University of Kentucky's got one of the world's leading um, uh, entomologists, especially in the world of turf, Dr. Dan Potter. He has done tons of this type of work. And again, it's so common sense, but so many people forget about it. And it is important that we protect these pollinators. So I always tell people, it's never the grass or that lawn plants problem. It's the people that are managing it that keep making lawns look bad. So something as simple as that can really make all the difference in the world. Now, the other thing about the spring is to plan on weed control if you think you need to. And the best pre-emergent weed control strategies, pre-emergent before weed emerges is what the name means, are based on clues provided by mother nature. If you really want to get into it, my colleagues here, they use growing degree day models and uh, you send me some information say, I wanna know how to do that. It's not that hard, but most people aren't into that in terms of tracking it, but that's uh, what golf course and high-end sports field people do. I tell people, look at your clues from Mother Nature, from Mother Nature, and make sure you know your basic plant materials of Mother Nature okay. And that plant is one of the most effective clues out there, and that's the forsythia. But you have to be really adept at being able to identify forsythia and know that uh, witch hazel, uh, might be blooming in uh, far southwest of Virginia, eastern Kentucky today or soon, and witch hazel ain't forsythia, and you don't apply pre-emerged herbicides on the basis of witch hazel. The other common sense strategy, and this was uh, used in a webinar that I was on last night, would be even to refine this further, is think when your jonquils start to uh, bloom. That's even, to me, is even more uh, standard in terms of less chance of uh, a forsythia getting an urge to uh, bloom a little bit early. Main thing with forsythia is when it's fully engaged, that's telling you soil temperatures are now at a point of where if you're going to apply a herbicide for crabgrass control, it better be going out there very soon. So there's no distinction in control of your turf grass seed and the weed seed from most of our pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, matter of fact, just about anything that you all will have access to, unless you are an LCO doing some really interesting stuff, is you're not gonna have access to anything that provides selectivity. So keep that in mind. If you're gonna do spring seeding of turf grass, that does not go hand in hand with spring pre-emerge, okay? And is a follow-up necessary? Typically not if you've got a thick, healthy turf grass. Otherwise, maybe you're scheduling that second application that typically is gonna be in the six to eight week window. But if you've got a good turf grass stand, your turf grass is controlling far more weeds than any chemical that you're applying because weeds are germinating on a regular basis and they essentially are starving to death due to lack of sunlight out there from the competition from the uh, turf grass. And here are the names of some of the most common products that are out there. These top three in particular, if you go into the lawn and garden centers, southern states, et cetera, and look for these names. And I provided uh, for Phil and Pete share those with you all, this handout that's got all this information on there. And if you don't get it, then email me. It's goatly at vt.edu and we'll get it for you. But look for things with these top three. These are kind of the Cadillacs of pre-emergent herbicides used in most of our lawns. Some of them also have labels that will carry over into uh, landscape beds, but not all. Many of these products down here get more of a landscape bed use uh, to do that. But check for these types of names and check out that label. These top two in particular, okay, in Southwest Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, Prodiamine and pendimethyl. That's kind of our go-tos and those are our industry standards and they'll give you a good six to eight week response. And we don't want them to go much longer than that because we don't want these things to have negative effects on plants and on the environment. But that's our standards for weed control. And again, watch the uh, 
the, the, the March lilies, the jonquils, and the forsythia, and use those Mother Nature clues to make the timing of the application. And what about these types of plants? This is uh, that neighbor's lawn that I showed you that was in its glory when it was all in flower, and now they mowed the flowers, and it still is majority dandelion. And you're looking at it out there as things, and just look at it. This is a lawn which, you know, I'm talking with a neighbor saying, you need a soil test. I'm sure this thing needs some fertilizer. It needs some grass seed. You know, this is a lawn now that to me, this is no longer environmentally responsible. There's bare earth here. This is a, a possibly erodible site. But if you saw these weeds, could you put post-emergent herbicides on them? Remember, a pre-emergent, no effect, useless on this. It only controls things germinating from seed. But you could apply a post-emergent, and there's a ton of these things out there. These are products like uh, 2,4-D based products that uh, maybe they have 2,4-D, dicamba, MCPP. They're called the uh, broadleaf lawn herbicides, two to three way combos. You can apply those. Uh, make sure these things are growing. Again, when you're when things are needing mowing, you know they're growing, you want to treat then, but be very careful in the spring because if you're planning on seeding, there are seeding restrictions on these labels, even though they're not pre emergent they will affect germinating seedlings. And think about what's going on with all the other plant material in your landscape. All that, uh, that new growth, those new buds, extremely sensitive now to these chemicals possibly drifting or coming into contact with them. Far more sensitive than would ever be in the fall. And so even post-emergent weed control is typically best delivered in the fall because of the safety to the rest of your landscape plants. All right, I've touched on several things, not all things. Uh, for those of you in Virginia, and this information is available to anyone in the country, but in Virginia, remember when it comes to pest management that our go-to, and these are things that Phil and my VCE colleagues used, it's our pest management guide, which you can find online uh, at the Extension website. And all these things are available as free downloads, et cetera. And you can see all the lawn and garden publications that I have through Virginia Tech uh, for Shad and for Jeremy and my friends over in Kentucky. Uh, take a peek at UK's website. They've got the same type of information there. And again, I'm jealous of what a lot of the stuff that Dr. Munshaw and Dr. Powell still have in play over there. And I've got great hopes one day to get there and and maybe before I retire here in five or six years, I'll get it done. But uh, great resources there that I point people to, even from Virginia, to look at that. And for those of you in Kentucky, if anyone is a turf grass management professional, keep in mind that UK still does offer this program. Last year, I had the pleasure of, uh, before things shut down, of going back uh, to uh, Shepherdsville and speaking at this in person. Uh, they do the Kentucky Turf and Landscape Management Short Course. This year, it's virtual. Uh, looks like it's going on. It happened to uh, uh, be tomorrow, I guess. What the heck is today? I've lost track of time. No, it's today. So you can still pick up the last two. But keep this in mind if you're in the industry about this resource that the UK team puts on. And then for uh, my Virginia folks, if you're into uh, turf grass as a career or possibly just want to know more, uh, we're midway through our first year ever of teaching the School of Turfgrass Ecology and Management, which is an online program uh, that combines both uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, that are recorded with a uh, two-hour Q&A session each Wednesday night. We get together and talk about the topics. We go for 13 weeks. Uh, we will pound turfgrass management into your brain over 13 weeks of doing this. So there is a significant cost because we tell people we ain't fooling around. We only want you if you're serious about doing this. And uh, class one this year has 34 guinea pigs seeing if we can figure out how to use this. So if you have interest and want to know more, shout at me, but uh, we'll be queuing it up again in November, 2021 to get people enrolled. And then we'll kick it off in December, 2021 and run it through March of 2022. And I told you about the Twitter stuff. Uh, if you should do this, um, follow uh, any one of us there to keep up with what the heck Virginia Tech's got going on. Uh, Dr. Travis Shaddix at University of Kentucky also does their Twitter page in that part of the world. Uh, but uh, we use it primarily as an extension-based account. 
Uh, I promise you, I won't tell you that I'm picking up milk at Walmart. Uh, I'll post things. I did post a, a, a sports turf picture uh, from a time of my service with Sports Turf Managers Association about eight years ago today. But my tweets all have to do with turf. Uh, so that's my promise to you. I won't waste your time. All right. That brings me to the end. And I'm going to stop the share. And I'd like to answer as many questions as I can for anyone that has anything. All right, I see Tom's question there. You got moths. How to deal with moths. Sell your house and move. Uh, that's gonna be a tough one, but it's a great question. Uh, first thing you got to do if you haven't done it in a while, moss is indicating to me two things. Um, soils, pH, possibly out of whack. Usually moss shows up in very acidic soils uh, and moisture and or shade. Uh, those are ideal conditions. We actually have an extension publication. It probably gets more hits than anything that I've been involved in. And you can find it on the Virginia Cooperative Extension website. It's called Lawn Moss friend or foe. Uh, I wish I could tell you, boy, we've got it figured out for control. It is one of the most difficult to control uh, and most simplest of plants that we have to this day. Uh, but that publication talks about what you can try to do. But quite honestly, our chemical options are very, very limited. The best thing typically is improve the environment as much as you can. Uh, get grass back in there, let the grass compete with the moss. Uh, but we do list some things in terms of chemical approaches that you can take, but uh, it is very, very difficult. And uh, we even had people that gave up trying to kill it and uh, heavily shaded uh, uh, acidic soils and they've turned their landscape into a moss garden. Uh, and it looks beautiful and it's so nice to walk in, uh, but you can't put a lot of traffic on it. And uh, believe it or not, you could you go out and pour glyphosate Roundup on moss and it won't kill it. It'll just make it mad. Uh, it's an amazingly simple plant that is very difficult, unfortunately, to control. So that's a great question. Uh, wish I had a better answer for you, but that's one of the uh, still scratching our heads. It's just like if one of y'all is gonna ask me about moles and voles, <clears throat> okay? What a great question, get a trap. Okay, most of our other efforts just don't work. All right, what else, folks? So copper is not effective on moss? Fixed copper, up. iron, they all do have application. And that's part of the stuff that's in that uh, publication, Chad. Uh, but it is okay. a multi-treatment. you got to stay at it. Typically, you need to go out there and uh, rough up the moss, do anything you can to upset it and then get on a program and start treating, treating, treating. And then you gotta be very careful that you get those pHs up where they need to be. And especially in the mountains, y'all think about a lot of sites that get disturbed and uh, the, how close that cold seams can be to grounds. Uh, you can get some really interesting things happening in terms of pH. Uh, and I see these uh, quite, not quite often, but more often than uh, I anticipate and if you start applying copper and iron and things out there, you get some really wild uh, toxicity situations going on in those sites. So you're right, copper-based compounds, iron-based compounds, that's kind of the best that we have right now to go. And those are the products that Dr. Askew listed in that publication. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. There it is, long lost friend or foe. And you're going to find out that it's a very strong foe uh, to do that, to fight. All right, anything what you, else? What do you do if you've got uh, something like bent grass that uh, came in in seed and it's starting to spread and you know how it gets those uh, runners? Um, the runners, yeah. And you don't so we want have got, I'm going to put it in the, the, uh, the box here, but I mentioned this compound, but the, the savior for bent grass, and again, one of the safest products we can use. Now it's challenge, its price has really come down. The trade name is Tenacity, and the uh, common or the active ingredient is mesotrione. 
it's a product that I tell folks based on its cost, you need to go in. It needs to be a neighborhood approach. If you're out buying this stuff by yourself, you're like, ain't no way I'm going to pay that for that little bitty container. It is extremely selective on bent grass and our cool season grasses. And it's the first thing that we've had to do that. It even takes um, nimble wheel out of cool season grasses. And that was forever when I was at UK and AJ was fighting nimble wheel and all those horse farms around Lexington. And you couldn't spray these chemicals because it'd kill a multi-million dollar horse. And what do we do? Uh, this product also has activity on that. Uh, it will turn the weeds ghostly white. It will scare you to death. Uh, but that will be the sign for you that the product is working and the uh, the turf grasses that are tolerant, uh, like the fescue, like the bluegrass, will very quickly recover. The bent grass might take a follow-up application on a 14 to 21 day interval. You got to kind of follow the label particularly, but that product revolutionized our ability to control bent grass and to control nimble wheel in cool season turf. So tenacity uh, and prices have come down a lot, but it's still not a really cheap product to find out there because it is so specialized. We also have a, have a question. Uh, what are your thoughts on using nematodes to eliminate grubs instead of a pesticide? We've done a lot of that work here uh, with, uh, I was served on a committee for a PhD student four or five years ago that worked, they call those things entomopathogenic nematodes. Uh, he also looked at a whole group of fungi uh, that are out there. And these are commercially available um, biologicals and there is merit to them. They are not snake oils, however, when it gets to putting these things out into an environment with the diversity that we have in soils, his three years worth of research said, do this in a controlled environment, in a greenhouse and in, in potting soil or sand or in a growth chamber. And look how amazing these things are at controlling grubs. Guess what happened when he went to the field? Look how non-amazing these things are at not controlling grubs. And it's because there's so much diversity in the field that we introduce these things and the populations of these types of biologicals, which again, we're not talking ripoff products. These are real world stuff and they, that's what they do, but we can't keep their populations high enough and we can't keep them um, in terms of the competition with other microbes that are out there in sufficient quantities to do their job. So all of our biological strategies to this point in time, which we keep looking for, there's gotta be ways we can do this. We continue to try to look for those things and no one's gonna stop as far as I know. They're, they're, they're valuable, they're viable. They are no way, shape, form competitive with standard insecticides. But I, I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying don't expect to see similar levels of control. One thing to think about is uh, old product, and they had problems a few years ago, but think about the uh, bacillus that we still have out there. I'm sure it would be politically incorrect now because the product I grew up with was called Japademic for Japanese beetle control. And it was a form of bacterium that you apply. And it picks out grubs, but it only controls Japanese beetle grubs. And so if you have mask shapers and all this other grub complex, those of you from Kentucky, did you ever fish with June beetle larvae? <clears throat> did you ever fly June beetles around on thread? <clears throat> because I couldn't wait for June beetles to emerge. And I don't know if they do that in Wise County, but in central Kentucky, uh, I would have flying fortresses of beetles with threads tied around their legs and we would fish with their grubs. But those products, very selective. Uh, Japademic would not touch a, ja a, a beetle grub from a June beetle. It would only control Japanese beetle grubs. And now you get into, well, how do I know what kind of grub I have? We could talk about that, but we'd have to get pictures out. And we'd be looking at the rear end of grubs, and it gets way beyond our scope for tonight. What else? Very good presentation. Yes, thank you very much. It's my pleasure.
So my email, I'm going to type it down here. I didn't send that message. Let me see you hit this because I told you I typed it in. If I can help you, goatly at vt.edu is how you get in touch with me. So let me know. And if I don't have the answer, which is pretty much the norm these days, I, I do know lots of people now in this business. So I'll find you one, okay? And uh, be glad to search for you. All right. Great info. Great info. Thanks. Thank you, man. Thank you. You're very welcome. I hope you dodged you. The, uh, the ice storm in that neck of the woods. I uh, hope, hope so. Much. Hope so. And uh, Shad and right. Jeremy, what's coming up uh, next week on the Zoom series? All right. Uh, next uh, Tuesday, we have basic landscaping. Um, and um, Dr. Bill Fountain uh, with the University of Kentucky, he was, he was with us back in the fall. Uh, he's going to be with us next Tuesday. Uh, talking about basic landscaping. So we're going to transition into turf grass and we're going to add some bushes and shrubs to your landscape. And so he's going to be talking about, uh, talking about that. And then on Thursday, um, we have uh, Ron Flannery and Ron is a, uh, he's a Wise Countyan. He lives at Big Stone Gap and he's a na uh, nationally renowned railroad historian. And he's going to be uh, talking about uh, when all railroads led to Black Mountain. So uh, he is well versed in the, the Louisville Nashville Railroad as well as the, uh, the Southern and the Norfolk Western that came through our, our area, CNO. Uh, but uh, he's, he's gonna be with us next Thursday. So a lot of photos and a lot of history on that. Uh, a lot of landscape information Tuesday. So tune back in. Great. All right. Thank you all very much, and I uh, hope everybody has a has a good and safe evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, y'all, for coming. Thank you. It was great.